So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You've had quite an array of science presented to you so far. So I want you to imagine that you're now a member of staff of the Atlantic Salmon Trust. And I want to draw on the analogy that was given to us by Gerald earlier. What do we do? Well, the way I explain the work of the Atlantic Salmon Trust is really uh, in the context, again, of a financial analogy. We're brokers. What we try to do is bring people together, bring resources together, bring ideas together to try and get the action that's required in a practical sense to try and give those extra fish, the surplus of fish that's required for the good angling that Tarquin is now missing in Scotland. So that's really what we do. Before I start, I want to acknowledge my co-author, Walter Crozier, who's with us today. So at the end of the presentation, if there's anything really clever and really innovative that you take out of the presentation, it's all down to him. I'm really only the spokesman here. But I think it's very interesting in terms of it trying to draw together these particular ideas. Given that it's our 50th birthday, let's look back a little bit. And at this point, I want to acknowledge Jeremy Reid over my right. Jeremy is one of our former directors and one of uh, really a very eminent director, as all of them were. And uh, part of this is what Jer Jeremy led and what other directors led. So when we were looking at planning uh, the conference, I remarked uh, to the board one uh, day when we were having a meeting that the one thing that always fascinated me about the Atlantic Salmon Trust, long before I joined it as a staff member, was the fact they have this uncanny knack to actually be in the right place at the right time and pick the winner. And just to give you a flavour of what they've been involved in and what we collectively have been involved in in more recent years, it started off with a great burst of enthusiasm and interest around the time when those big fisheries developed in the Faroes and Greenland. At the, at the time, that was catastrophic, and it was combining with the dreadful effects of, of UDN at the time, of this dreadful salmon disease. Something had to be done. So there were two things that happened at the time, and the two things were actually very closely linked and about 10 years apart. The first thing was the formation of this Atlantic Salmon Trust to try and look at research and try and fund, and as I say, broker research into the areas that were being neglected. The second thing that was needed was some form of international group that would actually look towards this major international fishery that was taking place. So the formation of NASCO in 1983 was absolutely seminal to the management of those high seas fisheries. Who was in the middle of all this? The directors from the Atlantic Salmon Trust. Equally, it was seen then that there was a lot of interesting technology, much as John has shown us now, developing in North America. How are we going to get this knowledge back? We joined forces then with ASF, so our marriage is not new, we just forgot about it for a few years. And we designed then this Bessinger Liddell Fellowship. And through the fellowship, and one of the former fellows um, is with us here today, uh, David Solomon. But through those fellowships, we brought back technologies <coughs> and techniques that were only in their infancy in Europe. So in terms of, uh, for instance, genetic stock identification, <laughs> uh, was instrumental in bringing back at, at a seminal point. In terms of river restoration, which I think David looked at, and in terms of the use of coded wire tags, which John Brown, who used to work for the Irish Department of Fisheries, brought back. I mean, these were all passé, but these were absolutely novel at the time and passé now, and AST was seminal in bringing that knowledge back. I think really the two things that have driven us towards this idea of having to go to sea and trying to understand what's happening at sea, and indeed having the courage to go to sea and do that, was the development of two particular initiatives. And these were done through what's called a concerted action through the EU. So the EU basically gives you funding to try and bring these bright people together. And SAL model that my co-author Walter led, um, SAL model was really interesting because through SAL model, we got to really refine this whole idea of conservation limits. The idea that these index sites that we're all talking about, the one I used to run in Borishul is well over 50, indeed it's over 60 years old now. Those sort of data sets are invaluable, but you can transpose them. You can take those data sets and apply them to someone else's river. So this whole idea, again, was quite novel at the time. And from that came the idea of biological reference points, and then maybe, just maybe, we could actually predict what was happening in terms of the fish coming back to the coast and how many there were there. So that laid, laid the whole foundation for the idea of having a risk assessment and a manager being able to decide, well, I'm willing to take a 50% chance 
that my river is going to recover, so I'm going to let these guys spin and I'm going to let them use treble hooks. No, I'm going to be much more conservative. I'm going to go with a 90% risk that, you know, that my fish are going to survive well. I'm going to restrict all the methods. Managers are now in the driving seat because of that. I remember actually the next one, Salgen, very well because there were individuals and there were groups who really thought these geneticists were off their tree. The idea that you were going to be able to look at the genes of these fish and to be able to look at the individual populations seemed crazy at the time and very far-fetched. And again, we facilitated through AST, we facilitated Salja. So we had all those pieces, but what we were lacking was really information in relation to what was actually happening at the time. So that's a graph from 2005. It's surprisingly like the graph that Gerald showed us earlier. So we had fallen, fallen off the perch in terms of our marine, our knowledge of what was happening in the marine. We needed to get out there, and we needed to get out there fast. It was as early as probably 2002 when we started to have discussions in relation to Salsi. Very similar to the approach we took in terms of uh, the Salgen, looked on as crazy stuff to start with. We thought about growing massive numbers of ranch smolts, putting tags in them, releasing these out to, out to sea and trying to chase them out to sea. And then we decided we'd take a risk. And another man who's in the audience today is Phil McGinnity, who convinced me um, in a pilot study in Ireland to actually run with the idea that this genetics would work that we could go to sea and we could actually look for regional tags and individual river tags at sea. While we were doing that, the AST was funding Dick Shelton and our Norwegian friend Jens Christian Hulse to go and do some absolutely seminal work at sea. Again, would they find smolts? Yes, they found smolts because of Jens Christian's detailed knowledge of those surface layers of the ocean that Glenn talked about earlier. We then did a big pilot survey where we actually took some of the pilot technology in terms of the genetics, we went out off the west coast of Ireland, we caught fish and we assigned them. That gave us great encouragement that the actual South Sea program itself was going to work. Again, the core funding for a lot of that came from AST. Just to give you some idea of how big that South Sea program was, looking at it in crude monetary terms, about 17 million in terms of English pounds, both in terms of money in kind and direct cash. It was down into all of those different sub-programs, four different sub-programs. But in terms of the European side, in addition, as you'll see on the lower right-hand side, in addition to this funding that AST put in place outside of Salsi and to prepare by Sal for Salsi, it was very interesting because AST, uh, through our former president, the late Duke of Westminster, we were actually able to put real money into a program. And for Europe, in terms of looking for European funding, this was very special. We weren't promising lots of hours and lots and lots of hard work. We were promising cash. And because AST actually was able to give that donation of cash to the program, it was matched by the Total Foundation in France. <coughs> and suddenly we had a program that was actually going to work. And it was through that process then that we managed to secure three and a half million of EU funding. That's brokering. That's the way it works. That's what we want to try and do into the future. This is collective work. This is the sort of interdisciplinary work we need to repeat. These are the 20 groups all over Europe and North America that were involved in terms of those particular programs. These are the creatures that we're most interested in, these little smolts on the way out to sea. So we finally got our money. We finally got our ships. We had a ship from Norway, a ship from the Faroes, and a ship from Ireland. And we had then got cruises of approximately two weeks at a time, uh, so six cruises in total. In terms of doing that work then, we had to trace out where we thought we should go. Again, we were back to Jens Christian Hulse and his incredible knowledge of where these smolts might be. The sets of lines that you see there on the screen at the moment, so that was the cruise path that we actually asked some of the Norwegian boats and the Faroese boats to take. We did okay, we found fish on practically every trawl, but we weren't getting big numbers. Then we decided that maybe we would do something that was quite different. We would trawl then in the final year in between the actual tracks that we'd done before. And bingo, we started to get fish and we got interesting fish. We got some fish that were relatively thin, perhaps Mr. Wall's fish. They were quite thin, some of them had quite a load of parasites, 
Um, so maybe they were the fish that were not going to make it for the very first time. This is the sort of technology that we used. Back to Jens Christian again, he developed these floating trawls that we used. We got more yeah. mackerel initially than we did salmon smokes, but it taught us a lesson. They were mixed in with the mackerel, they were mixed in with the herring. There were some adults, but predominantly what we were looking at was a mixture of sea trout, and smolts, all sorts of other sea fish. So it was very interesting to see where these fish were. Surprising catches in terms of sea trout, way, way out in the ocean where we wouldn't have expected them. So lots of things to learn. So the next two slides, I just want to repeat some of the stuff that Glenn was saying earlier, because I think it's worth reinforcing it, in terms of the idea of a conveyor belt of smolts which is really something that came out of Salsi. And remember now, you have countries south of that particular diagram, you have France and you have Spain, and all of these are feeding out smolts from late March onwards. So smolts are being fed into the conveyor belt right up to July as it goes up to the northern Norwegian coast. So if you get this idea of the conveyor belt and the actual um, uh, lift in the conveyor belt is filling with smolts as it moves north, that in essence is the way we're visualising it at this stage. So we went and we physically sampled for the first time in terms of these particular groups of fish that were joining that big conveyor belt going north. So in summary, what did we find? What we found was that the distribution pattern of specific populations of salmon, remember at this stage, they were spatially mapped. Okay? <coughs> and we were also able to assemble some maps for individual rivers, which was really exciting. So where they had a very particular genetic uh, marker, we were able to trace them and we were able to fill in some very interesting trace maps. So one of the best, I'll show it to you in a moment now, was one of the most ancient salmon populations that we have in the world. That's the Loire Allier in France. So we were able to track it to its feeding grounds. The Ban River in Northern Ireland, we have no idea where they came from, but the most peculiar fish genetically, but it was great for us and the Namsen in Norway. So they were winners because they were individual rivers. But as Gerald said earlier, we're struggling because we're still looking at regional tags. Tags where groups of rivers were actually invaded by the, the, the migrants as they came in after the ice. But it's still helpful, but we need to, need to get down to the, to the actual individual river level. Um, as Glenn has shown very clearly, the distribution was clearly linked to ocean currents. Let me just give you one little phrase, a wise phrase, that a guy from NOAA in North America said to me many years ago. Um, he was like Glenn, he was an oceanographer. He was not unlike Glenn, he knew nothing about sound. And he was sitting with me in Galway in the Marine Institute one day, and my job was to brief this guy on salmon, and he was going to apply magic, and he was going to use his big models and tell us what was happening at sea. And it was really a great collaboration eventually. So he was very quiet, real mathematician, very deep, and I was babbling away as usual. I wasn't sure whether it was all going through to him. And he stopped me. And he said to me, now, tell me again, Ken. He said, what are you saying to me? They go out at? And I said, well, maybe, you know, 12, 15 centimetres. And he said, they come back at? And I said, oh, 55, 60 centimetres, maybe a year later. And he just looked at me and he said, they ain't doing much swimming. And it was very interesting because it just struck me. What Gerald was saying earlier, in terms of energetics, these fish have to put on an awful more, lot more weight than they're losing. And that's a very important thing to remember, is that these fish ain't doing much swimming. So even, they are, even though they are doing swimming, the net gain is enormous. So again, we're at a loss in terms of how they exactly do this. We know as well that in terms of uh, the changes, in terms of those surface layers in the ocean are actually quite profound. So based on earlier work that had been done, uh, we know that the sea surface temperatures had got much, much warmer at times. We also knew that the boundary layer, the lower distribution limit, if you like, of some of the key plankton species was moving north. Some of those boundary layers were moving north at 30 kilometres a year, about 18 miles a year. They were being replaced by other species of plankton, but the whole thing was changing very, very quickly. Some of those species of plankton may be ideal, but some may not be. So this is, this is what the fish are facing into. As Glenn showed us that fantastic image of the complexity of these currents, inside that, these fish at 18 centimetres, 15, 18, 20 centimetres, are beavering away trying to find this food. As Glenn mentioned, a revelation to us was Michael actually put together that, that uh, uh, animation that Glenn was showing. And we were able to understand the difference between a 2008 year and a 2002 year. How quickly those fish, if you watch the graph, 
by July, those fish were up in the feeding grounds. At that time, some of the lost fish, or putative lost fish, were struggling around the shores of Iceland. So that's the difference that a wind component can make in terms of the distribution of the fish. And certainly in terms of um, the growth of the fish as such, um, it was very clear that it was poorest for those stocks from the southern area, from France, from Spain, from Ireland, from the UK. And this interannual variation in terms of the wind fields was quite extraordinary. How surface currents could make a difference, much, much greater difference than we could possibly have imagined. The one thing that really absolutely blew me off my chair when I first saw it and it was first explained to me was there were certain anomalies in terms of the distribution when it was modeled <coughs> because there were points in the distribution where it would seem that the fish had to actively seek out additional currents to move north or else they might have looped back around and come back to where they started. So there is a component, of a directional component as John was showing rather than it just being this passive component. So we have a highly sophisticated system that we're looking at. So what are we looking for? What are we trying to build here? So this is the Loire Allier that I mentioned earlier. And this is just to give you an idea. This again is just a theoretical current based on the returns that we got over several years. These are the sort, the sort of routes that these fish may very well follow. And this is the general feeding area. Incidentally, in the context of what um, Tarkin was saying earlier, when we did our big survey, we found the vast bulk of the fish we found were in this area. And you remember Tarquin showed a nice arrow that Sergei had given him going across to this area. We found no Russian fish. We found no Norwegian fish. We couldn't find them over two years. So we certainly think that perhaps they're a good bit further north, and they may very well be under that ice, as uh, Tarquin was indicating. So that's just by way of background, and just to mention, as Gerald, uh, I think, was saying, um, all of these presentations will be available on the AST website, and you'll be able to get access to all the information and more information through those various links. So we sat down then at AST board meetings and we said, right, we have all this information from Salsi. Now, it's been a great few years. Um, we have all this information. What the hell do we do with it? How do we move forward? How do we actually then focus in on what needs to be done? So the next thing we did then was to say, right, let's look at this in terms of pillars. So pillar number one, is the Glen Pillar. That's the high ocean pillar. That's understanding the constraints to survival at sea and developing new ways of protecting stocks during their marine phase. Second pillar, inshore and coastal. Finding ways to reduce bottlenecks to survival by understanding the role of coastal waters and estuaries in the lives of salmon. And thirdly, freshwater, where really we have majored up to this, but our interest would be mainly in maximizing, looking at research to maximize the survival of naturally generated uh, and healthy wild smokes. In that context then, I won't go through all this, but we had loads and loads of subsets. Lots of things we'd like to do, and we said, well, really, in the context of our 50th year, we need to evolve this 10-year science strategy. And to be honest, I was really struggling with this. It looked like a wish list. And we gave it to our scientific advisory panel, and these guys and girls are great. They don't hold back. And they said to me, Ken, this is a wish list. You know, how, how are you going to do this? And what bits of it are you going to do? How do you prioritise it? So we were seriously struggling. In parallel with this particular strategy, we produced a strategy on aquaculture. We were able to agree it, sign on it and get it out. We couldn't get this science strategy together. There was something missing because it looked trivial in terms of just giving out this list without knowing how you're going to stick the pieces together. So the first decision we made was, right, let's take a piece of the jigsaw. And let's look at these three pieces indeed of the jigsaw. Let's look at the acoustic tracking in terms of telling us more about the actual survival rates of the fish. And really, there was again, there was a seminal moment in this for us because certainly having spent a lot of my time, as Walter has done as well, on index systems that are within really, you know, spitting distance of the ocean, you imagine a small journey starts when it gets in your trap. And you tend to forget that you really should be looking at from the time the fish actually becomes silver. So that's really important to us. So when we're thinking about the actual survival of these fish, the survival of smokes, the idea that these, th these fish are not density dependent, that really starts to take shape the minute these fish actually go silver. So all of these mortality factors, right down through the river, right down into the estuary, right out into the ocean and right out to sea, all of them have to be looked at. And that's the small job that Matt has to do. 
he has to pull together this idea of the tracking to try and pinpoint the questions that need to be answered and to try and put together then agreements and programmes of cooperation that can tackle that. In terms of then looking at what's happening at sea, another colleague who's with us today in the audience, uh, um, Jens Carlson, um, he worked with me then in the development of this idea of basically taking water samples or slime stamp samples and looking for remnants of DNA in these, in these samples. And he and his team have managed now to develop an Atlantic salmon actually, uh, if you like, a genetic tag or an assessment method that can identify whether or not we have particles of salmon DNA in those remnant pieces that might be on board a pelagic vessel or whatever. Another great advance, I think, in terms of where we're going. In terms of impacts, the one thing that we're all concerned about is the whole question of aquaculture and aquaculture impacts. So again, through Sarah, we've taken this initiative, as Robbie mentioned earlier, to see how we can make a difference in terms of trying to pinpoint where we can improve in terms of the impacts of aquaculture and improve the overall survival of sea trout and salmon in those particular areas. So we did all that, and it all sounds great. But the depressing part is that 10 years later, the graph looks almost the same. If anything, this is from the river bush. It looks even a bit more depressing. So you can see the 35 going to the 5 that uh, um, uh, was mentioned earlier by Gerald. How are we going to do this? And that's when Walter stepped in. And Walter has had a lot of experience in the last 10 or 15 years then, looking at the whole question of how to deal with complex situations in marine biology, rather than specifically just in salmon biology. The first thing you have to understand, and it has come home to me, particularly in the last few weeks, we're about to launch a new modeler that you will find on our website and the Institute of Fisheries Management website, that tries to bring you through how salmon populations work. And our problem is that they are extremely complex. And some of the responses we got back when we sent it out for review was, well, can't you make it easier? Well, I'm afraid I can't. God did this. I didn't. So it is a complex business, but you, you just have to try and roll with the punches to some extent because you couldn't possibly have something that will interpret in a very simple way. But at the same time, you have to try and make it accessible to people. So my big, my big uh, uh, worry, as I mentioned earlier, was targeting and prioritising research. So SALSI had identified the potential sources of mortality, but it hadn't quantified these. Based on previous experience in managing marine fisheries, as Walter had told us, it's possible to identify an overall strategic framework, and this I think is the key to it. A strategic approach is needed to place candidate mortality factors, all of the things that we talked about today. We put them in a, in a spatial and temporal framework and try and see, can we prioritise them? Can we look at them in some sort of prioritised way? Um, we can do it at various scales. We can do it on a river scale, we can do it on a regional scale, we can do it on an ocean scale. So the scales, the scales are not really that big a job, but you have to be conscious of the fact that you have to work with it at different levels. So the overall objective is to quantify the potential of each factor that I've mentioned to influence the survival. So, what are the likely suspects? What could be causing the mortality? Um, John mentioned just a few minutes ago reams and reams of different theories. Let's go through them and let's try and give them a number and see, you know, is there validity in what people are saying and challenge them to produce numbers. Identify the likely impact both individually and collectively of the suspects. Now, what we're doing here, it's not modelling in the sense of trying to put in all sorts of variables and look how they interact, certainly not initially. It's more akin to, again, back to that analogy with, with finance, it's more an accounting exercise as such. And the key objective is to target research through this and to refine initial estimates of the potential scale of mortality at each point. And a particular focus would be on identifying where and how mortality factors have changed between an earlier period and now. So that's really what we're looking at. So the question really is, if, if more salmon are dying at sea compared to earlier periods, these losses must be accounted for somewhere. So we look at the missing fish, we go back to Wald, and we, we're looking for you know, the, the, the holes in those engines. What additional mortality in terms of numbers of salmon is needed to account for the difference, and where should this be allocated? We'd have to look at North America, we'd have to look at Europe, we have to include one and two sea winter fish, we have to look at all of the various complexities that I was talking about. There may be things that are very similar, 
there may be things that are very different. For example, in terms of things that are very different, um, there's probably not an awful lot of commonality between what we're looking at in terms of the damage from pelagic fisheries in the Northeast Atlantic and harp seals and the predation levels in uh, the Labrador Sea. But where there is commonality, as we've seen several times this morning, is in terms of Greenland. We all share Greenland. You know, and we now know we all share the Faroes because until about maybe five years ago, we didn't realise until we looked at the scale genetically that there was a component of American fish taken in the Faroese offshore fishery when it was extant. So what I want you to look at here is not the numbers at the bottom, because I put these up in much larger <coughs> format, but this is my theoretical, uh, this is my theoretical uh, uh, corridor. So what we have on the corridor then is putative numbers in terms of you know, what might be happening in these locations. This is purely for illustration. So what we're looking at is, we're looking at the UK, and we're looking at the total number of fish coming back to the coast, the pre-fishery abundance of the fish. So if you look at that in terms of the period 1971 to 1975, it was just over a million fish. In terms of the pre-fishery abundance, 2012, 2016, 495,000. So again, you know, in or around that third that we keep talking about, but that's a big drop. So there's a half million fish missing. So where have these fish gone? So what we're trying to do then is, we're trying to basically draw up a balance sheet so we can account for those. So in terms of the near shore, um, what you have in the near shore is, you have two numbers. But one of the numbers, this top number here, is the fish going out and the other is the fish coming back. So one is on smolts and the other is looking at mortality factors in terms of the fish, in terms of the fish coming back. So what you have in terms of uh, the near shore and the coastal is a mixture of seals, sea lice maybe from salmon farms, avian predation, but there's a range of different ideas and estimates out there what might be happening. So again, if you plug these in to your accountancy system, you can make some effort at actually understanding what the level of the problem is, and most importantly, you can make some effort to tackle it. In terms of bycatch, there were two particular uh, potential risks in terms of bycatch. We had a bycatch in this area here, exactly where we know our, our uh, smolts from southern Europe actually feed, but also increasingly in this area, area here, as the mackerel and herring move west, we know there's an increasing problem in that area. You sum the two of those, and potentially you have 56,000 fish falling there. Let's assign the rest to the conveyor belt. Let's say that 266,000 fish, we can't do anything about that. Because constantly I'm told, oh Ken, you keep talking about this high sea survival and so on. But really, there's nothing we can do about it at the end of the day. It's good for you as an academic to know about it, but there's nothing we can do about it. In this particular scenario, what we're doing is, we're tackling 53%. And I would actually put forward to you that that's, um, you know, that's far, far better to approach it in that way rather than a situation where you look at it in the context of the round and say, we're losing all of these fish, well, what we'll do is we'll just concentrate on freshwater. I think there's a lot more that we can actually do. And as I say, the <coughs> basic concept for this, the idea and the development is all Walters, um, based on his own experience in relation to marine fisheries, where he's actually put this into action and where it's actually worked. What I've shown you is a very, very, very simplified view of the approach that might be taken. So what are we going to do with this? Well, we've already discussed it with our scientific advisory panel. We've had some really good comments and some really good refinements from them. Walter, at the moment, is preparing a presentation that we'll give in two weeks' time at NASCO to the International Atlantic Salmon Research Board. If we get the endorsement of the board, um, and if they're enthusiastic, there's a basis for moving it forward, We'll then organise a workshop, hopefully it'll be a joint AST, ASF, NASCO workshop, but we have feelers out for that at the moment, but we would have a workshop for maybe six or eight people to really refine this, to look at the existing modelling that's going on, and certainly the tendrils that have been put out by water would indicate that there's a real appetite for looking at it in this way and trying to join forces with some very sophisticated modelling that's ongoing at the moment, looking at that pre-fishery abundance area. So this is a concept, it's a way of looking at it and a way of targeting the research that certainly from an AST point of view is really invaluable to us in terms of being able to focus and judge in relative terms you know, where our investment should go and how we should actually manage the research.
if we're really, really, really good and really successful, we can then uh, hopefully uh, get an invite to go to the working group on North Atlantic Salmon to actually review this in more detail. And hopefully it will be included in terms of one of the many approaches in relation to understanding exactly what is happening at sea and how and where our fish are dying. So really that's what we're putting forward this weekend as our contribution in terms of the way forward. This accountancy idea, a concept, and as good brokers we're going to stand back now and we're going to try and encourage people to actually come forward with their investments. We're going to try and guide it and make sure that in the context of the outcome, that the outcome is both practical and realistic in terms of the time frame that it might take. Thank you very much indeed.